Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Eric Tate from Vernonville Asset Manager, where I'm the founder and president, here to talk to you about the top three insights I have learned on structuring investments to close more deals. Give you a little bit of background about Vernonville Asset Management. We primarily focus on three areas, real estate for current cash flow, and we do some development, private debt and notes, and angel slash venture investing. And we do most of the venture investing through another company I founded with three other partners called Urban Capital Network. Now, to level set this talk, what I want to do is make sure that we focus in on what I view capital raising as and what it is not. So to me, capital raising is not being the sponsor of a deal or operating the deal. Granted, most of us who started out, and maybe many of you listening still do, are the chief cook and bottle washer where we do it all. But I'm really looking at this and talking about this from the standpoint of capital raising being its own standalone business, whether or not you're operating the deal or the sponsor deal, putting it together, each of those are actually different areas of a business that can literally be standalone. And so for our talk today, we're going to talk about capital raising from its being its own business standpoint. And so in our agenda, what we're going to talk about is, for me, number one was understanding kind of who my investors were, and you should understand who your investors are. Two, understand who your partners are. And I, and I mean by that on the operation side. And three, and lastly, but not leastly, is understanding yourself as you put together this business. So starting with understanding your investors, what is it that they want? And I, what I mean by that is, can you segment out in a very specific way what the people in your database or the people that you raise capital for want, even outside of what it is that you do, right? And that's a very different thing that we're going to talk about a little bit. Because when I started this, I didn't know what they wanted, right? I thought what they wanted is what is what I needed. And I fell flat on my face doing that now. And we'll talk about that in a second. And once I learned to give them what they want and to build and structure projects and go after projects that gave a return profile for what they wanted, our business exploded. And so, you know, I started off as a neighborhood rent man, right? And like many of you maybe who are listening, and I still own these assets, right? So I'm not poo-pooing them in any way. We own dozens of single family homes still, right? But when I started out, we were having success in 08 and 09. I had some physician colleagues who wanted to join us. And what I thought about was what I needed. And at the time, because banks were shutting down lines of credit and weren't lending, I needed debt. So I put together a debt syndication. I thought I was a hot shot. It was pretty. It was great packaging. And I fell flat on my face, right? Couldn't raise it. I raised $25,000, right? And everything made sense. All of my projections made sense. But my investors weren't interested in debt. They were interested in equity at the time. And so that was a valuable lesson that taught me, don't give them what you need. Give them what they want. Once we had some success, we stum essentially stumbled into angel investing because I had the company on the left is a, a blockchain technology company in the oil and gas space. And, and I had a friend who was a CFO of the company and they were doing their seed investment round. And he said, hey, you know, are your investors interested in angel investing? And as a lark, I said, well, I don't know. Let me not assume for them that they're not. I'm going to put money in this deal. So let's see who else may want to do that as well. And so lo and behold, we put it out and in a span of six weeks, we raised a little over $600,000 to be a major investor in their seed round. And they've gone on now to raise a series A and in, in, in moving into a B. The same thing on the right company is a CBD cream company, um, the only FDA kind of compliant CBD cream company on the market. And we did the same thing in a six week period, we raised a little, a little over $600,000 to be a part of this company, which has great growth prospects. And so that taught me, don't assume that just because they're investing in the thing that you primarily do, and for me, it was primarily real estate initially, that your investors aren't interested in other things that you yourself can help them in. Now, of course, the caveat is you have to be willing to invest in it yourself and believe in it. You're not just doing deals to, to do deals. Next for me was understanding my partners. Now, same thing. What is it that they need? Now, many of you guys are the operational people on your team. So you're raising capital and doing the operations. So you know what it is that you need. And so you look for investors that are going to coincide with what it is that you need in terms of what they want. But are there other people who are in adjacent industries, who, people that you know, people that you know are highly competent, just like you are, but are capital constrained or balance sheet constrained? You being able to walk to the table with a group of investors gives you, I won't say leverage, but gives you an asset that you can use for yourself to be able to do more deals. Now, they may be deals that you yourself are not going to be the primary 
operator on. But if you trust the people that you're that are in your circle, you can work yourself into deals where you get equity, your investors get get access to more deal flow, and you've helped out another person in need who's in the operations business like you are. And so we graduated from doing the single families and small multifamilies into doing these large triple net commercial projects. And so these projects you see here are all triple net commercial projects. We closed on these projects over the last 18 to 24 months. And it was because a promoter in the Houston area that I had known for a few years, he and his partner, they had 18 centers between them. They had run out of money and they came to me and said, Hey, are your investors interested in this? And I said, what's your pro forma? What does it look like? And once their pro forma matched what I knew my investors wanted, I said, absolutely. And so we became the largest. I created an, an SPV or a fund for each of these projects where we are the largest LP in all of these funds. So we write one check. And then in this, I became part of the GP. So 100% of the proceeds flow through to our investors. I get my proceeds from the GP side of the, of the deal and everyone is happy. So that's just one way to think about structuring a project that if you have investors you can bring to the table, you can get into projects, offer your investors new and diversified assets, and you yourself can gain equity in projects that you yourself didn't necessarily have to put together 100%. Now this, these are actually light industrial projects. So this is this is about a half a million square feet of, of triple net commercial. This is about a half a million square feet of, of triple net light industrial. All of these projects were done at the same time. This is a different group of partners here. Um, one of my partners on this is, is one of my real estate attorneys. And he and his partner, same thing. They have many, many different assets themselves. They had run out of their own money or didn't have enough money to, do the, to begin to do these larger types of projects. Came to me, I said, absolutely. The difference on this deal is I am not part of their GP because their banks wanted all of their GPs to sign um, guarantees. I was like, nah, I'm going to pass on that. And so what I do on my fund, the SPVs and the LLCs that I put in as an LP in each of these, is I override my fund. So it's either an 80-20 split or 90-10 split at my discretion, always keeping in mind that I'm pushing as much to my investors as possible to meet their, their expectations, but still reserving within the documents that I myself can get paid from this process as well. <coughs> Excuse me. And I'm also an, an, an investor as well from that standpoint. And so this is just another way that you can bring your investors projects that you yourself may not be the primary operator on, but you can still add value to your capital raising business as well as to your investors. And then kind of the third way to potentially structure a, a deal is this is a fintech company that only lends to physicians and dentists. And so I wanted in on that company on the equity side. And what I found out was the, the partners were selling equity out to fund the loans. And so one of my alumni um, brothers from college knew one of the founders. I was already going to Atlanta for a gala, literally on the back of a napkin. I laid out for him that you're going to basically sell equity and dilute yourself to hell. Let me put together a debt fund for you. I will get equity for put for all the amount that I raise. So you're not going to, so you're not going to give away total uh, as much equity as you would have trying to fund through equity. We'll give our in investors a nice return. They'll make the spread between the two. And we're doing this to bridge them to their larger debt facility. And that has worked out well over the last three months. We've put about a million and million one um, in notes for them, um, which has allowed them to bridge their $20 million debt facility that's about to close at the end of the month. And this is, just, again, is just creative financing, understanding that I knew what my investors wanted. I had already done a debt fund that had failed. But now that I knew and was able to parse out my investors, I have a lot of physician investors. I knew that they would want to help the next generation of physicians. So now this became a mission-based investment, not just a monetary investment. I knew what this company needed. And so I put the two together and was able to get equity out of it. We were able to get some fees out of it. And so it made sense and it worked for everyone involved. Lastly, the understand yourself. Now I'm a big personal development guy. I go to personal development conferences, you know, Zig Ziglar, all those guys are people that I have looked up to and I and follow. And so for me, going into this process, understanding where my area of competency was, understanding how to create in such a way that it pays me in a, enough for it to make for it to be worthwhile for me to do and knowing that this is what i love to do put deals together talk to investors look at different business models 
I look at everything through the lens of how do I do this? Now, I couldn't do this from the beginning. And many of you can't do this from the beginning. You've got to pay your bills. You've got to keep your lights on. But as you get bandwidth, as you get to the point where you can be more selective in the things that you do, take a step back and think about how it is you really want to be spending your time, right? Because this to me, where this bullseye lands right here, to me is one of the most important things possible. If you can operate in that area as much of your time as humanly possible, you will never feel like you're working a day in your life, right? And people always forget the payment side of it, right? A lot of times you go after the passion, but eh, it's not paying you what you want. This is a way for you to be able to structure in your capital raising business, a remuneration model that makes sure it compensates you in a way that will keep you motivated. And so to give you an example, this to me kind of was my watershed moment. This project here, um, C-class apartment project, 100 units in the hood in Houston, hood was gentrifying and I was a chief cook and bottle washer, right? I put the deal together. I raised all the capital. I was signed on the note, all of those things. Little did we know that when we got into the deal, once we pull back the walls after we did all our inspections, but couldn't see behind the walls that this thing needed way more work than we initially had anticipated. And so this watershed moment almost became my Waterloo moment in that this thing almost took me down. Now we got lucky. We bought it right, bought it for just under 2 million. I just had to hold on and get it fixed up. We sold it for over 4 million. Our investors got a good return. But what it taught me was that I don't like operations. And because I don't like operations, I'm not doing operations anymore. And so I've decided to dedicate myself to the types of assets we wanted to own, understanding what I want through them, and then picking the greatest operators in the world, world-class guys, and just bring capital to them. And that's kind of my journey. Figure out what your journey is in this process. Figure out if what you're doing right now, either on the operations or capital raising side, is what you want to be doing. Because when times get tough, if you hate it, you may not push through in the same kind of way as if you loved it. And that would be doing your investors a disservice. So as much as possible, make sure that you're working and operating within that circle of competency, passion, and skill that we talked about to make your life as you build your capital raising um, company going forward to fit what it is you want and you need for your life. And so in conclusion, we talked about kind of understanding your investors. That's kind of the bedrock foundation, because if you understand what your investors want and you can walk into any deal with millions of dollars in your pocket that you know you can put in, that opens the doors for you and your investors to partner with world-class operating partners to get you into more deals so you can do more deals. Everything that you saw that I just showed you, that's only a, a, a portion of what we've done, has happened over the last four years. And the big commercial deals over the last 24 months. So you can get into more deals when you understand your investors and understand your partners. And for me, it's fun because you know I'm sitting here recording this in my front bedroom because I've created a life that allows me to do this for you all. And I'm happy about it. And so please, I hope that you all get able to do that. And so I want to thank Richard Wilson and the Family Office Club team for allowing me to speak to you all. If you have want to talk to me or connect, this is my contact information or just contact the family office clubs and they can get you in contact with me. Thanks for listening.